Hello everybody, um, my name is Gareth Hayes. Um, I'm here to talk about server-side prototype pollution. So welcome to server-side prototype pollution, black box detection without the DOS. Detecting server-side prototype pollution legitimately is quite difficult because it involves changing the uh, state of the object prototypes on the server and that can almost certainly cause denial of service. I've created multiple techniques that allow you to detect SSPP without bringing the server to its knees and without needing the source code. So a little bit about me. I'm literally obsessed with JavaScript. I work for Portswigger as a full-time researcher and I love my role. I get to do lots of uh, new attack techniques. And I like to do crazy things. So, for example, if I get something in my head, like, for example, I wanted to create a browsable 3D world with CSS, so I became obsessed and just did it. Um, so you can browse the, the, the world, you can use the key, your, your control pad, uh, your, your keys on your keyboard, sorry, and then browse the world um, and just like a first person's perspective. And it's all in CSS, no JavaScript at all. Um, so yeah, it's great, great fun to do stuff like this. And I read, read something on Stack Overflow that um, said that parsing HTML with regular expressions is impossible. So I decided to do it with JavaScript and that was good fun as well. So I created um, a JavaScript sandbox using regular expressions. Um, yeah, just for fun. Uh, that's the sort of stuff I do. Um, I, I've written a book called JavaScript for Hackers, which is um, details my approach to JS hacking. So check it out if you're interested. So first I'll give uh, a brief introduction to JavaScript prototypes and prototype pollution. Then I'll discuss why DOS is a big problem. And next, I'm going to cover the detection methods, go through my first failed attempts um, that caused denial of service, then cover useful techniques that you can use as a manual tester to verify prototype pollution. And then after that, I'll dis discuss automated detection methods. I'll share a generic technique for detecting prototype pollution. And I'll show you how you can use the Burp uh, Collaborator or similar tools to detect prototype pollution asynchronously. I'll share a surprising discovery that resulted in a method to detect the JavaScript engine and even leak JavaScript, JavaScript native code. After that, I'll introduce an open source BAP that will detect prototype pollution. And we've also created some academy labs that will enable you to uh, test prototype pollution and get a, a grip of how it works um, with real world, uh, real world labs that you can try and solve um, to learn it more. Um, and then I'm going to show you how to prevent prototype pollution, the best methods, and then I'll, fi I'll finish up with key takeaways and leave five minutes for questions. So first I'm going to give you a brief introduction to prototypal inheritance and how prototype pollution occurs. So if you have an object, a user defined object, and it's got two properties, and you modify the object prototype to add a C property, as long as that user-defined object does not contain that C property, then it will inherit from the global object prototype. So your user-defined object will have a C property. Almost all objects inherit from the object prototype and the prototype ch chain is uh, used to determine what properties uh, an object should have. So here at the bottom, we've got a user-defined object with a, a property and it goes up the prototype chain to the object prototype to check properties on that property, on that object. And then it carries on until it gets to null. Um, so most people think it stops at null, um, which is correct in modern browsers. But I did some research in the past, for, um, uh, JavaScript, uh, JSON hijacking for the modern web. And Chrome used to allow you to customize that and you could steal uh, data in JSON uh, with a UTF-16 character set. It's quite interesting, you should read up on that. Um, so you can actually customize that object in previous versions of Chrome, which is super interesting for me. So JSON.parse is a common cause of prototype pollution because it enables you to create an object that has a regular own proto key. So what do I mean by that? So first, if we create an object, as we've seen before, with an A property, and we look at the proto property. So the proto property is not a property on the actual objects, it's an inherited property. And if we call the has own property function, 
So this function tells you whether this is an inherited property or not. So in this case, um, it's false. Uh, so has owned property is saying that um, this doesn't have a regular property. This is an inherited property. And what gets interesting is when we use json.parse to parse json with a proto property. So suddenly now, when you use json.parse, you actually have a regular property, a, a regular proto property. And this is one of the components of prototype pollution um, because um, the library will enumerate all the properties and it will see that it has an own property. So normally the library will filter out the uh, proto property because it's an inherited property. Well, because this is a regular property, then this can result in um, a component of prototype pollution. Another component of prototype pollution is the recursive merge function. So in this example, I'm using Lodash. Um, this is a merge function. So it merges an object on the left with the object on the right. So this request body is under the attacker's control. Um, and um, when the objects get merged, this is why prototype pollution can occur. The recursive merge function enumerates the properties of the source object and assigns them to the target. I can't show you all the code right now because it won't fit on the slide, obviously. But however, the, the gist of it is the object gets enumerated, which can result in prototype pollution if the keys are not sanitized. So when the assignment happens, because you've enumerated the proto property, when the um, property is used, the it will then be turned into a special getter setter property like proto um, and then that will assign on the object prototype and that's why uh, prototype pollution happens. You might be wondering what is possible with server-side prototype pollution. Well, you can change the apl application configuration or behavior and that can result in uh, RCE. Uh, Mikhail Benkowski and Paul Gerst both found RCE using prototype pollution in different applications. Um, you should check out the uh, write-ups. They're really, really good. So when I first started uh, testing for prototype pollution, what became apparent was denial of service was a big problem. There is a catch-22 situation when detecting prototype pollution. If you're testing legitimately, you don't want to cause denial of service. But without denial of service, it's hard to know if you were successful or not. And that's the problem, really. You need to know, has the server behavior changed? Ideally, what we need is non-destructive techniques that change the behavior of the application subtly. So in this section, I'm going to show you my first failed attempts at detecting prototype pollution that caused denial of service. So my first attempt, uh, so what I did, I customized Node um, and it... Um, the customizations enable me to find prototype pollution properties, uh, which I dubbed Node Invader. It works by finding properties that access the object prototype. And one of these pro uh, properties that I found was encoding. So using, using a JSON request, so here I'm injecting um, prototype pollution with the encoding property. And that just took the server down. Um, and it takes the server down because the exception is coming from Node itself. And because X is not a valid encoding, the server will just shut down and you have to restart it. Or it, if the application catches that error, then it, it's still going to cause problems with the application. So obviously, this is not good for um, prototype pollution detection because it just takes the server down. So after many failed attempts, I decided to take a different approach. This technique changes the methods on the object constructor itself. So before the probe, I send some JSON data and get a 200 back. And when I send the probe, um, I change the keys method on the object constructor. So this, interestingly, isn't actually prototype pollution because there's no prototypes involved. But what it does enable you to do is determine whether you have control over properties via JSON. Um, and what happens when you send the data again? So if we resend the uh, base request with just some sample JSON data, 
we get an internal server error back. And the reason we get an internal server error back is because the keys functions attempted the keys function is attempted to be called, but because it's now a string, it will throw an exception. So this is again a way a means a means to detect prototype pollution, but obviously it causes denial of service on the server, so it's not great. So after trying many different properties, I started to guess them. I thought, okay, what about the expect header? Uh, maybe we could use that. So first I sent um, a blank JSON request and got a 200 back. Then I sent a probe with the expect property with some arbitrary value, in this case, lead. And then when you send the request again, instead of a OK 200, you get a 417 expectation fail status code. So this was cool, but this, this code was appearing every time. So obviously um, not ideal. Um, so I needed to investigate why this happened. And because I just guessed the header, um, I thought, okay, we need to debug this in some way. So yeah, I, I had no idea where the code happened. Um, so I used the dash dash inspect dash BRK flagging node. This is a really cool flag because it will enable you to intercept um, the any code that's uh, executed before it, before anything else is run. So um, it, it basically sets a breakpoint before your application code is executed. Um, and then I use this code in the slide here. Um, to do a console.trace whenever the expect property is read. It appeared to be in the node HTTP server code. They were checking that the property does not equal undefined, which unfortunately means that there's no way to use prototype pollution to set that to undefined um, because there's nowhere to do that from JSON. Um, so unfortunately, this wasn't a suitable uh prototype pollution technique, but it was an interesting discovery that led me to uh, find out how to use Node um, to inspect properties like this. So this wouldn't be a talk uh, from me without XSS being involved somewhere along the way. Um, and today was no exception. So first um, I sent a, a blank uh, JSON request and then I got um, a JSON response back with the content type application JSON. So the content type here is uh, interesting, um, as you'll see in a minute. Um, so here I inject uh, some prototype pollution with the underscore body property, uh, set it to true, and then supply an evil script with the body property. And what happens then is the, um, the JSON request gets converted to HTML. And this happens because um, a dev would send the response with the object and that object gets manipulated into a HTML response. Um, yeah, so that, that was fun, but obviously you don't want to call stored XSS everywhere unless um, on, on the application. Well, yes, you do if you're testing legitimately. Um, if you're not testing legitimately, but if, if you... Um, if you want to test for prototype pollution, you can't really use this um, because, yeah, you'll get stored XSS on, on the site. So obviously not that great. Not that great. So the previous vectors failed um, as, a valid as a valid technique because we don't want to take the server down and we don't want to break its functionality. Ideally, uh, what we want is a technique that we can switch on and off. So we've looked at vectors that can break the application or take down the server. Now what we're going to look for are vectors that can subtly change the application behavior. These vectors didn't make it into the scanner, but are still useful for manually testing for prototype pollution or combining them with other attacks such as cache poisoning, as you'll see in a minute. Um, so this technique changes the maximum allowed parameters. So before the probe, we send uh, two parameters, x and foo, and foo's assigned to bar. Uh, so if, and foo is reflected by the application, so we can see that it now contains bar. Um, and then we change the maximum allowed parameter limit via prototype pollution. So this changes the application to only allow one parameter. And then when we make the request again with the two parameters, 
foo is now undefined so that we've successfully used prototype pollution to subtly change the application behavior and it won't um, it won't cause a problem on the server because you can use an upper limit of maximum allowed parameters. Um, so this didn't make it into the scanner because of the reflection requirement, um, but it's still a really useful technique for manually verifying prototype pollution. Um, in this technique, um, modifies the, exp uh, the express library to allow uh, a question mark in a parameter name. So before we send uh, a request with two question marks with foo equals bar, and we notice that foo is now in undefined, so the application is reflecting the, f the foo parameter. And then we send a probe, uh, so foo is not reflecting the, um, the parameter, sorry, the application is not reflecting the foo uh, parameter. So then we send a probe with uh, prototype pollution that changes the, no uh, the express option, ignore, ignore cre uh, query prefix to true. And what that does is ignores one of the question marks in the parameter name. So then when we send the request again, we actually get the, the value reflected correctly. So uh, this technique can you can be used um, with prototype pollution and cache poisoning. So um, you, you could use this technique to combine it with cache poisoning. Um, so I, I found that interesting. Um, so this technique allows you to create objects from parameters. Um, so before we send the probe, um, here we have foo.bar equals baz, and we notice that foo is not reflected. But if we change Express's behavior uh, to allow dots in the parameter name via allow dots equals true, when we send the original request again with foo.bar equals baz, what we actually get back is an object. So this is a good way of manually verifying you've got prototype pollution, and also you can use it to combine attacks. So if the application is expecting a certain object structure, you can use this uh, express configuration to create objects and then um, exploit them. So UTF-7 is a base64-like character encoding that was used in the past to create encoded XSS vectors in legacy browsers such as IE. I used to love this char set, it was really good. Um, so I decided why not have a go at using it in some way. So before the probe, I send um, a UTF-7 encoded uh, value. So in UTF-7, you see most examples just encode like less than greater than, but it's actually possible to encode the whole thing. So this is just, it looks like it is just base64 with plus and minus. Um, and if we look at what the application reflects, it reflects it just as is, like it's an encoded value. But if we inject some prototype pollution with a content type, we can change that uh, the JSON response to a UTF-7 char set, which is super interesting. So when we send the probe again, what we actually get back is foo.bar. And what actually happens is the response is served with a UTF-8 char set, but the actual JSON itself is decoded as UTF-7. So you can use this to determine if you've got prototype pollution because you can see your values decoded by the server. So I identified the line of code where this property was read, but I was writing up this technique and uh, Andre, really awesome copywriter at uh, Portswigger, asked a very valid question. How come the original char set in the request content type header doesn't prevent prototype pollution? And that was a really valid question because as we've seen, if you have a user defined object with a property, with a specific property, then that won't be inherited. Uh, it won't inherit from the object prototype. Uh, so after I analyzed many lines of code and debugged, debugged a lot of JavaScript, what I noticed was, um, the original content type in the request was being moved, was being removed when the uh, polluted content, when when you remove, you use the pol uh, polluted content property, this was because uh, Node has this add header line method. I was looking for dupe it was looking for duplicates by checking the property name on the destination object. This would mean the original content type would be skipped 
um, when injecting a polluted content tag. So to understand that, um, the line of code that's in red here, so Node is checking the destination object contains a specific field. Um, if the specific, specific field is undefined, then it will add the content type to the uh, request. But what happens is because we've polluted the content type, Node will skip this value because it thinks it's already uh, already been defined. When it hasn't, it's been polluted. And this is why it works. So this was quite tricky to track down, but using the various Node flags, um, like dash dash inspect and stuff, um, you, you could find it eventually. So um, now we're gonna discuss techniques that can be used for automation. These techniques can subtly change the application behavior without causing denial of service. So this technique changes the padding of the JSON response. So before we send the probe, we pass some JSON to observe that there are no space in the raw response. So here, we look at the raw response in Burp or another proxy, whatever you want to use, and we, we look at, at the response and it does not contain spaces. Then we create a probe that alters the JSON spaces property in Express. And what happens is when you send the original request again, you actually get spaces. So this is a great way of uh, determining if you've got prototype pollution because it's harmless. Um, you, it changes the application behavior and you, you, can, you can be pretty sure that there is prototype pollution. Unfortunately, one of the devs de decided to patch this off his own back, which credit to him, but it was annoying for me. Um, but since then, I've found more generic techniques that can be used to detect prototype pollution. Um, so yeah, this was a good starting point. So I looked at other modules too, and I thought the cores module would be a good target as it's commonly used with API endpoints. So any base request will do in this instance. So we just need a response. Um, and then we send a probe that alters the exposed headers configuration by adding an array with foo. And what this does is when we send the request again, we get an access control exposed headers response. So you know that prototype pollution has occurred because you can control um, this header with, with a value. Um, so this was pretty a good way of detecting prototype pollution in, and is in the scanner. Um, so this technique changes the status code to determine if prototype pollution worked before the probe. We use, uh, we use some inv invalid JSON, which then a trailing comma to get back. Um, so yeah, so here, we, we create some invalid JSON, so we use the comma. Uh, the comma creates invalid JSON, and then when we send the request, we get a 400 bad request back, uh, because obviously this is invalid JSON. But we can use this because when we can modify the status code, so here we inject some prototype pollution that changes the status code to 510. Um, and when we send the invalid JSON again, what we get back is a 510 not extended status code. So we can use this to harmlessly detect prototype pollution. Um, and we can also switch this off. So you can send prototype pollution again with a value of zero, um, and then it'll go back to its original behavior. So this is a really good way of, and a reliable way of detecting prototype pollution. And it's easy to impl implement in the scanner. Um, so, this is the options technique. So here we have uh, an options request and we get back the methods that are allowed. So post, get, and head. If you inject prototype pollution uh, with the head property and then assign it to true, then what happens is um, Express will um, ignore the head uh, method. So you can use this difference to determine if you've got prototype pollution because um, the head method has been removed and you can reset this again um, and uh, confirm. And it, you, you can be pretty sure you've got prototype pollution if this happens. So now I've talked about the different techniques to detect prototype pollution. But what we need really is more generic ways of detecting it. Um, so 
This technique uses property reflection to determine if prototype pollution is likely. So first we inject a proto property with some arbitrary value and then get a response. And then we inject proto X with a value. And this time we do get a response. So we know in this case that proto is behaving differently. Um, and we can use that. And also, if you make a request here um, without a probe, so without any properties injected, you've, you've already injected them once, the second time you make a, a, a probe. And if you've got either of the properties in the response, what that means is, A, you've either, either got prototype pollution, or B, you've got object persistence, and in both cases are interesting for investigation. And um, this is a really good way of um, detecting prototype pollution is very likely. Um, so this one was found uh, using the Lodash library, but it, it is a generic technique that is likely to be applied to other libraries. So what you do is you inject um, a polluted property A. So here we inject in prototype pollution with an A, a property and any arbitrary value and also a regular A property and a regular B property. Now, what happens What happens is um, if prototype pollution occurs, the object prototype will contain the A property. And when the object is merged, Lodash uses the in operator. And the in operator basically says, does this property exist in this object or does it exist in the prototype? And that's key because if that property does exist in the prototype, uh, Lodash will skip it. So when you get the response back, the A property will be removed. So this is a highly likely, uh, highly likely uh, prototype pollution technique because um, the A property has been removed. That suggests that the library is looking at the uh, prototype to check if it exists. So this only works because um, if the object is the merged object is being, being reflected, which is pretty common. Um, so yeah, this is a really good way of detecting if prototype pollution is highly likely. So Paul Gerst blogged um, about an exploit, um, a, prototype, a, a, a prototype pollution uh, vulnerability in the SuperJSON library that resulted in RCE in Blitz. It was a fantastic blog post. Um, I really recommend you check it out. Um, it's there. Um, yeah. So let's discuss. Well, let's find out how this works and how SuperJSON uh, library works. So this, I agonized of this slide quite a lot because it's hard to explain. But after discussing this with James, James Kettle, my colleague, we came up with the best way of representing this. So SuperJSON library is weird, right? It allows you to specify uh, properties um, in the actual JSON and reference them and read them and assign them to other properties in the JSON. So for example, here, brands.0 means get the first brands uh, object. And then the array value says, move that brands object into the path defined in the array. Bit weird, right? But yeah, that's how it works. Um, and you can abuse this uh, functionality to cause prototype pollution um, because you can specify proto.target key. Um, so target key will be assigned on the object prototype and the value will be obtained from the JSON. So it uses the JSON property key name to get the path and the, and the, um, uh, the key from the, um, array uh, value. So what we can do though, is instead of using uh, proto and then the key, you can use proto.proto. .proto. And the reason that we're doing that is really good because this is a really good way of detecting prototype pollution in SuperJSON. So what happens is we try and modify the a non a non immutable uh, an immutable object in Chrome um, or in V8. So um, here, proto dot proto um, is, is assigned to an object, and what Node will do is throw an exception 
saying the immutable proto object cannot have the prototype set. So we're trying to modify something that we're not allowed to do, and we can use that difference um, to determine if you've got prototype pollution. So if you use proto.proto .proto with an object, you'll get an exception. But if you use proto.proto .proto and assign it to a string or a null, you won't get an exception. So this is um, a really cool way of um, detecting prototype pollution in the SuperJSON library. So to, to summarize what I just said, so when you use, when assigned to proto.proto, .proto, using an object literal will throw a type error, uh, whereas using a primitive such as a string or a null will not. So this offers a really good way of detecting SuperJSON uh, super style prototype pollution. So in this section, I'm going to show you how to detect prototype pollution asynchronously using the Burp Collaborator or similar tools. So here are some node syncs that are vulnerable to prototype pollution. And what's interesting is that you, to exploit these syncs, you don't actually need control over the arguments. Um, so you can use prototype pollution to um, gain access to, to you, you can uh, get remote code execution be, um, using prototype pollution. So um, this paper by Mikhail Shershabakov um, and everyone else um, all demonstrates how to exploit these things in the previous slide, in the previous slide using node options. Um, node options allows you to pass command line um, options to the node process. Um, it's a really great paper, you should read it. It's pretty long, but it's really good. So yeah, we want, how would you scan for vulnerabilities asynchronously? Well, it's, it's dead easy actually. What you can do is, so I, I spent some time trying to come up with a detection technique to find usage of those things, of those things. But how do you do it? So the problem is that node blocks like certain command line arguments like dash dash eval in node options. However, if you use dash dash inspect, it allows you to specify a remote host to create a remote debugging session. This is ideal. So this creates a DNS interaction, which is perfect for scanning. So you pass the uh, dash dash inspect dash and then your callback, your uh, host that you want the, the callback to execute on. And this creates a DNS interaction, so you know that you've got prototype pollution, and you know you've got serious prototype pollution because if you can control the dash dash inspect flag, then you can execute arbitrary commands on the uh, on the server, which obviously is really bad. Um, so the problem with the previous vector is that some sites will scrape the JSON. Um, for for host names and create DNS interactions that will uh, produce false positives, um, which is not ideal. Um, so to solve this problem, um, I wanted to obfuscate the host so it won't work, but the command line argument would. So I tried all sorts of ways of obfuscating the host, including single quotes, curlies, etc. But in the end, I discovered that you can just simply use double quotes on every OS, so Mac, Linux, and Windows. So if you pass these double quotes, they're just ignored. Um, and if you've got a DNS interaction using this um, vector, then you've you've pretty much got um, prototype pollution because um, you'd only get that DNS interaction if prototype pollution occurs. Um, so every Mac, Linux, and Windows, every OS, will um, ignore these double quotes and yeah, you, you, you can be pretty much guaranteed you've got prototype pollution. So whilst conducting this research, I found um, it was possible to detect the JavaScript engine being used and even leak uh, code by just using certain parameters. So to do this, I just asked myself the following question. What would happen if you used JavaScript's inherited properties in a parameter name or a parameter value? Could you determine the JavaScript engine? So I modified the prototype pollution scanner to look for these properties. 
And to my surprise, I found that multiple sites leaked JavaScript native code. Um, so here we make a request to creative.adobe.com um, with a cookie creative cloud lock equals constructor. Can, can you guess what happens? Well, the response cookie header, set cookie header, actually contains JavaScript native code. So this is super fascinating because it proves that the cookie value is being used in a, in a property access um, and, that, and that value is being reflected. So you can see how this could lead to prototype pollution. Um, so the scanner will find this sort of behavior. And it wasn't just Adobe that had this problem. Um, on apps.apple.com, I think they've taken this down now, but um, when you use an inherited property value of as a get parameter, this will cause an internal server error. And if you followed up with non-inherited properties like value of X, it would not produce an internal server error. But with using other pro inherited properties such as two string, you will get an internal server error. So what it means is that they're using the um, value in the uh, parameter name um, in a JavaScript um, property access um, and, and that's causing an internal server error because they're expecting a certain object maybe or a certain value. So um, by using this behavior, you can discover uh, what the JavaScript engine is. Um, so for example, if you look at to source or iterator, you can detect that uh, Rhino is being used, or if you look for in specific inherited properties for um, a JavaScript engine, you can um, detect that engine. So if like to source doesn't exist, but other properties such as lookup setter do, um, there's a high likelihood that that is V8 and not Rhino. So I've released an open source tool called the Server-Side Prototype Pollution Scanner that will help you detect prototype pollution um, using the techniques in this talk. Um, you can also uh, use it to discover the server behavior with JavaScript properties um, in parameters in JSON like I demonstrated with the native code. Um, and we've designed some free Academy Labs too. Uh, the scanner is open source and will work on both pro and community editions of Burp. Um, and the source is available on Git, GitHub and um, will be, and you can install it from the BAP store. Um, you can practice your skills on the Web Security Academy because we've got uh, different labs that enable you to test for prototype pollution. Um, we've got RCE labs, we've got all sorts, so check those out. Um, so for more details on the techniques described in this talk, you can find it on the uh, white paper on Portswigger Research. So I'd like to f uh, finish off um, discussing how to prevent prototype pollution. Um, the best way is simply not to use object literals at all to, uh, to define option options functionality in your app. If you use set map instead of objects, you can safely use them without being vulnerable to prototype pollution. Set is used when you have a list of values you want to check or map is used when you have a key value combination. Um, if you can't use map or set, then you can use the object.create API, which will create an object. And if you pass null into uh, that method, um, then you'll create an object with a null prototype, which means that it won't inherit from the object prototype. Um, Node offers um, a command line flag to disable uh, proto completely, which is called dash dash disable dash proto equals delete. And if you do that, Node will remove proto completely. This doesn't fully prevent prototype pollution um, since you can still use attacks like constructor.prototype, um, but it's a good defense in depth measure. Um, thanks for listening to my talk. The three uh, t takeaways from my presentation are um, use a server-side prototype pollution scanner to find prototype pollution in your apps. Uh, safe black box scanning is possible and use set or map instead of objects when defining options like behavior or accepting the list of values. You can follow me on Twitter at Gareth Hayes where I post all sorts of crazy JavaScript and you can get the prototype pollution uh, scanner from GitHub. Um, yeah.
Any questions? Yeah. Did you try to scan at mass uh, for this vulnerability using your black box detecting scanner and how widespread it is? And also, uh, based on your scanning, uh, how many uh, applications which were vulnerable to prototype pollution could have like uh, useful gadgets to actually exploit something leading to, I don't know, access SRC or whatever, based on what you have said also about the, I don't know, disrupt, disruptive methods which you, which you have found, which you maybe didn't use in real life attacks because you don't want to break the website, but still might be possible. So you can assume that that was possible. Yeah, we, we, we scanned um, what we could scan really. So like we, we scanned major bug bounty sites. We've got a list of bi uh, bug bounty sites. We found interesting behavior on a lot, but exploitation is quite difficult black box. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we, we scanned quite a lot of sites um, and we've created labs that demonstrate the, the vulnerabilities too. And out of curiosity, when you reported, if you reported a bunch of them which might have been exploitable, but maybe you did not uh, uh, like demonstrate that they were exploitable. How did, I mean, that they was accepted by the developers, they fixed them, or they just said, like, prove me that they are exploitable, or I will just ignore them? We, we didn't report um, vulnerability, we, we didn't find vulnerabilities uh, en masse, so we didn't re report, report that. Um, but yeah, we only we only scanned the selection of bug bounty sites, and we didn't spend a lot of time doing that. We do we, we leave that to um, bug bounty hunters, really. Um, so yeah, you should you should be able to find stuff with this. Um, but yeah, we didn't spend a lot of time scanning um, a lot of sites. So okay, thanks. Always. Any other questions? No. Okay, thank you, Gareth. Cool.